Welcome to the Rusted Garden. Today is another long format video and this is all about fertilizing. I've taken my videos that I've done over the years with respect to fertilizing and I put them into one long video. There will be a digital table of contents so you can just look in there in the description and jump to the parts of the video you'd like to watch. I want to dispel a couple of myths first, especially if you're a first time gardener. Chemical fertilizers are not poisons. They can't hurt you they can't hurt your plant. If they're overused and abused at a high industrial scale like mass farming, they can kill out the life in your soil. But that's not something you're going to do. The reason I say that is because organic fertilizers are wonderful. Um, you can use them if you want. If you don't want to use them and you want to use a chemical fertilizer, I don't want you to think that you're poisoning your plants or that you're poisoning yourself. The truth of the matter is everything on the planet is a chemical compound, uh, chemical compounds made up of the elements from the periodic table of elements. So your organic fertilizers, worm castings, the chemical fertilizers, kelp, extract, everything is a chemical. Now, they're in different forms. So the organic fertilizers are really in a form in compounds that they go into the soil, the soil life breaks those compounds down and then they release nitrogen, phosphorus, and the elements that your plants need to the plants. And I'll talk about that in a second. The chemical fertilizers are synth yeah, synthesized, not synthetic, not fake. They go through a process where people use usually energy or uh, chemical reactions and change elements and chemical compounds into forms the plant can use. Your plants cannot tell the difference. Your plants do not care. People care, but that's up to you. So I just don't want you to fear that you have to be all organic or there's a problem. Now, a couple of things. Organic uh, fertilizers are really precursors to compost. So what do I mean by that? Most of your organic fertilizers could be thrown on a compost pile, let to break down, and then you use the compost in your garden. So if you're gardening, compost is your best friend. If you can make a lot of compost, you can really fill your garden beds up with that and your plants will do perfectly fine. After compost, or maybe equal to compost, comes worm castings. All natural, I like to call it the end product of nature because it's the uh, castings from worms, perfect for the garden. Then you get your organic fertilizers that are a step in between and then you have the chemical fertilizers that are processed by human beings. And again, nothing with the chemical fertilizer is fake. You just can't make fake nitrogen, you can't make fake phosphorus or anything like that. If that were true, Thousands of years ago, when the alchemists were trying to turn lead into gold, they would have succeeded. So I just want to be clear with that. Now, there's two kinds of fertilizers. There's soluble fertilizers and insoluble fertilizers. Most of your organic fertilizers are insoluble, which means the plants can't use them. The root system can't pull in the nitrogen, phosphorus, and such from there until the soil life breaks that down. So insoluble fertilizers are slow-release fertilizers for instance, in these seed starts, you wouldn't want to use insoluble fertilizer mixed in here because there's no soil life to break it down. So that leaves you with soluble. Soluble means that the chemical fertilizers or a specific type of organic fertilizer can mix with water, it becomes soluble, and the root systems can pull that water right into, their, in, into the plant, actually, and there'll be nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, um, and sulfur in there, the, the major macronutrients. So when you're doing seed starts, you definitely want to make sure you either have a chemical fertilizer or, or, an, or a, an organic fertilizer that is soluble, water soluble, because that's what they use. And then when you get out into your containers and uh, into your gardens, you use more of the insoluble. You use two different types. So I just wanted to preface this video series about um, chemical fertilizers aren't poison. Everything is a chemical and really know the difference between insoluble and soluble fertilizers. I hope you enjoy the video. Please use the digital table of contents. Thanks. Welcome to the Rustic Garden. Today I want to show you what over fertilizing your seedlings and your transplants can look like. And it's really important, probably the most important thing in this video, is to realize that your seedlings are going to start out healthy. You may have some fertilizer in the starting mix. You may add in some half strength liquid fertilizer a couple weeks into growth. But I want to just stress, make sure you use half strength liquid fertilizer and you don't overdo it. Your seedlings and transplants will be fine if you're feeding them at half strength every two weeks or so. 
Um, just establish a routine, believe in yourself, and don't start doubting you need more. More fertilizer can be bad. And this is what happens when plants, these are tomato plants that were over fertilized by probably three times the strength of a liquid fertilizer. The leaves have dried out and shriveled up. The plants are spindly and just not strong. They don't stand up. Here you can see the leaves are drying out along the edges. This is from too much liquid fertilizer. And you might be tempted to say, well, wow, they don't look strong. They look kind of weak. Let me hit them with more fertilizer. And that's only going to further compound the problem. How do you end up over fertilizing? Well, sometimes we think, you know, fertilizer is a good thing, so more is better. That's not true. Sometimes the starting mixes already have fertilizer in them, and then we hit them with a full strength liquid fertilizer, or we put in just a little bit more. And what happens is, is the salt concentrations, or the concentration of the fertilizer, gets into the, the starter cells. There's not a lot of soil here, and the higher concentration of the salts in the soil will actually draw water out of the plants, damage the leaves, damage the root systems. Now when the root systems get damaged and they're trying to grow, they're not going to be able to get enough nutrients. So they're going to start looking like they have nutrient deficiencies and it's really from damage. This plant is purple on the underside. Sometimes that looks like a deficiency from um, phosphorus. The yellowing leaves up top, you might think they need more nitrogen or they need magnesium. You can just see how purple they are and it just doesn't look like a healthy plant. This is not because it wasn't fertilized. This is because it was over fertilized and damaged. And then when you start seeing plants like this, you know, the first thing you think is I better add more fertilizer into the mix. And then here's a good example right there. You can see the leaves are drying out. They're yellow, some green in the middle, the underside is purple. You know, parts of the plant look healthy. The stem is purple. Burned out leaves. This is too much fertilizer that ended up damaging the root system. And this one's, you know, surviving a little bit more, but it has the same problems. And again, I just want you to remember, you have to trust yourself in that once you fertilize them with a half strength liquid fertilizer, they're good to go for 10 or 14 days. Don't overdo it. Now, how do you fix this? Well, I mean, these plants I'm just going to get rid of. I'm not going to use. If your plants are bigger like this, you really just want to put in a lot of water, let the water kind of pour out, and hopefully you start taking out some of the salt concentrations and fertilizer that's in there. But again, you don't need a lot of fertilizer to take care of your seedlings and your transplants, and too much will actually damage them, and I just wanted to show you what it looked like. Now. When do you fertilize? Well, a couple of things. There's two kinds of fertilizers. There's a um, insoluble fertilizer, which is usually fertilizer that you put into your soil, into your garden, mix it in, and then the microbes break that fertilizer down into a form that your plants can use. Starting mix doesn't have any fertilizer in it. We're not putting in any non-soluble fertilizers in here, so there's not really a whole lot of fertilizer, if any. <clears throat> Excuse me. When a seed germinates the seed coat the seed itself has enough nutrition to get the plant growing to about this size it has enough nutrition for the plant to break the surface grow its first set of leaves that's the first set of leaves that's the clue when a plant gets its first set of leaves about this size that you might want to fertilize it now we're going to fertilize our seed starts with water soluble fertilizer that's what's really important water soluble fertilizer is in a form that your plant can absorb right from the water and put into its system. Now there's two kinds. You can buy an organic fertilizer. Whoops, this is the organic fertilizer. This is a chemical fertilizer. You can use either one. I use both depending on what's available. It doesn't matter to me. The key is, is that you want an NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium number to be a 555 or less. Five nitrogen, five potassium, um, five phosphorus. The chemical fertilizers are usually pretty high, like this NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, is 1530, 15. That's too much. These aren't outdoors in containers or in the earth bed. So if you put in too much fertilizer into here, it's going to damage the plants. We want to bring this NPK number down to a 555 five, five or less. 
and all of us are going to be buying different fertilizers, so you can just do a little bit of math. So by cutting this to half strength, we're going to have a 7.5, a 15, a 7.5. Cut it down again to a quarter. Um, this will be down to like, what is that, 3.75. This will be down to 7.5. That'll be down to 3.75. That's close enough to a 5.55. So we're using this, something like this, at quarter strength. The Job's is an organic product. You can use it just like this. It's a 3.12. That's perfectly fine. That's enough fertilizer, even at this level, 3.12, to take care of your transplants. So we're going to water. And a setup like this probably needs to be watered maybe once a week, every 10 days or so, when the plants are just germinating because there's a lot of starting mix in here and then maybe once or twice a week when they start getting to size and bigger over a six or eight week period. You're going to want to fertilize probably within 10 to 14 days and this is how I set it up. I get a, a gallon like this. This is seed starting fertilizer less than a 555 and this is actually the Job's fertilizer just done the strength so it's one tablespoon, one measuring scoop into a gallon of water. This is actually a an iced tea bottle so and it looks like iced tea so make sure you mark on there that it's for plants so people don't drink it so let's just say I just fed this one in another video so I'm not going to feed it again so this is at about the three week mark 21 days I've watered it twice and I've decided to feed it a little bit later even though I said 10 to 14 days you're kind of watching the plants if the plants are staying green they're not getting yellow you you don't need to rush the fertilizer in the whole process of the six to eight weeks that it takes a tomato to grow or the eight to ten weeks it takes for peppers to grow you probably only need to do this twice so to do it let's just say this has become a nice light color this size is the perfect size to put moisture and fertilizer in there so I'm just gonna fill it just like that that's my first feeding let's just say for these guys so next week when this dries out I'm just gonna put water in it um, if they aren't struggling in the two weeks from today since I fed them, I'm not going to put any fertilizer in there. Probably in the third week I might. Now, the reason I said 10 to 14 days earlier is because that's the minimum. At a maximum, you probably want to be at 14 to 21 days, but you're sort of going to have to judge it. The whole key to this is not to overfeed your plants because if you put in too much fertilizer, you can actually harm them. So, you know, just take it slow. This will set this up for watering and for feeding. I hope that makes sense. So let me just do a recap. When you water, when the top has dried completely, about two or three days later, fill this up to the top with just water. That will be enough moisture to probably last a week. When the plants are bigger, you might have to do it twice a week. When you're going to water, uh, when you're going to feed the plants, you could feed them, you know, 10 to 14 days, 14 to 21 days for your first feeding, depending on what you're growing. And then you probably want to go at least one week, if not two weeks, of just watering and then feeding one more time. And that's plenty of food for your transplants. Welcome to the Rustic Garden. Today I want to talk to you about nitrogen. And it's going to be a lengthy video, but I really wanted to cover what nitrogen is, where it comes from, talk a little bit about organic nitrogen, um, synthetic nitrogen, chemically processed nitrogen, and just really let you know what it is, how you use it, and it'll give you just a really good idea of what you're putting in your garden. Nitrogen is one of the major macronutrients. There's actually two levels. The primary macronutrients are nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. If you don't have those in enough quantity in your garden, you're going to have issues with your plants. And then you have the secondary level, which is calcium, magnesium, sulfur, and if you've ever seen your tomatoes get um, brown spots beneath the tomato, it looks like it's rotting, it's usually a function of either not having enough calcium in your soil or your plant can't use the calcium in your soil. So the macronutrients are the main nutrients, but today I'm just going to talk about nitrogen. I will talk about the other ones really over this winter. Nitrogen is important because it's associated with leaf growth, stem growth. It's just about in uh, every protein in the plant. It helps your plant with defense against insects, with, against diseases, and it's part of the chlorophyll molecule. So if you didn't have, if you don't have enough nitrogen in your garden, your plants aren't going to grow well. They're not going to be leafy. They're not going to be green. They're going to have trouble with uh, photosynthesis. They're not going to develop enough chlorophyll. And you can kind of get the, you know, gist of it that the plant's not going to be healthy. 
Sources of nitrogen. Nitrogen, first of all, is a common element that makes up nearly 80% of our atmosphere. So it's a gas, we breathe it in. In that form, obviously it doesn't hurt us, but in that form, plants can't use it. So it's a gas that is all around us, but in its pure form, plants can't use it. So nitrogen has to be fixed or converted into something a plant can use. There's different processes for this. Um, a couple of them are biological compost, for example, as you compost down vegetable matter, leaves, grass clippings, the microbes, the organisms break down the product that's in your compost pile and it makes it, it actually turns it into a form of nitrogen that your plants can get to and use. Also you would have uh, beans, peas, this is crimson red clover, it's a cover crop. These plants fix their own nitrogen, which really means the root systems grow into the uh, soil and the roots have nodes on them that work with rhizobia bacteria to convert atmospheric nitrogen into a usable form of nitrogen. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Bottom line is the beans can pull nitrogen from the air with this relationship. So can peas, so can red clover, uh, alfalfa, different kind of plants can do this. If you were to grow, say, a cover crop of crimson red clover or just put lots of beans in, you let the root systems develop, they pull nitrogen into the roots, you then turn the plants over, chop it up, let it decay in the ground, you're going to put nitrogen right into your garden. And I actually do recommend that. That's one of the best ways to bring a nice form of nitrogen into your garden, if you have the time and the space and can do it. Then there's the chemical process, which is changing nitrogen into ammonia. All these things have to do with one thing. It's converting um, nitrogen into a bioavailable form. So d nitrogen has to be turned into a form your plants can use. So you have organic forms of nitrogen, compost, blood meal, fish emulsion, manures, urine even. And I just wanted to show you these uh, numbers don't go with these specific uh, forms of organic fertilizers, but it's just a way to understand what you're buying. So if you buy a product and it has 800 on it, the first number is always nitrogen. So by weight, usually it's 8% of that product is nitrogen, 12% of this product is nitrogen, 15% of that product is nitrogen. So when you go to buy uh, fertilizer, you really have to know what these numbers are. I have some videos on them, but the first number is always telling you the ratio of nitrogen in the product. So you have the organic forms, you have the bio um, logical uh, process that nitrogen is converted into a form your plants can use. You also have synthetic or in inorganic, chemical, non-organic, man-made, however you want to say it. It's basically nitrogen being chemically processed through a Haber process. He uh, created this, I think, at the turn of the century, and it really revolutionized gardening, uh, actually farming, because there were cheap amounts of nitrogen available for, you know, feeding the world. The process is basically taking nitrogen uh, through lots of heat, energy, through the chemical process. That's how you get uh, the, the synthetic label thrown onto it. You form a gas NH3. Now, it's in gas form. Obviously, you can't put that into your garden, so they mix it with water. When you mix it with water, you get ammonium hydroxide. This is a 5 to 10 percent solution of ammonium hydroxide and it's just plain old clear ammonia. You could actually use this as a form of nitrogen. I don't recommend it, but you could use it. Um, I've experimented before taking ammonia, putting it onto a cold compost pile. The nitrogen in here works with the brown uh, leaves, the brown matter, and kind of really ignites the pile, so to speak, and, and it does work out in that capacity. Then you also have a form of solid nitrogen that can be used, and that's usually um, urea, and that's when you uh, mix the gas with carbon dioxide and you get a, a form of solid nitrogen, and you can find it in this product, which is 20.5% um, urea nitrogen. If you notice, 24% of the mix is nitrogen when you use this. That's too high. You don't need this much nitrogen. You're going to end up getting very lush green plants, you know, very leafy greens. That's what nitrogen does. It really produces lots of leaves. But that's too high, and I'll talk about it as I go on. One thing I learned over 
the last 15 years is it really doesn't matter what product you use at your own personal choice if you go organic synthetic combination of both that's what I do you just don't need as much as we're told we need for the garden so we have water soluble nitrogen and we have water insoluble nitrogen the water soluble nitrogen like these products are fast acting as soon as you mix it as soon as you put it in, on your plants the leaves can absorb the nitrogen a lot of times it goes right to the root system fast acting 24 hours you might even see a difference water insoluble means that the fertilizer the nitrogen has to get into the soil it needs some sort of microbial activity that breaks down the source of the nitrogen and it makes it ready for the plant to use at some point so when you garden you want a combination of both really in for instance in the spring you might put in a slow release nitrogen fertilizer that will slowly release over the growing season at some point you may need to use a water soluble if your plant maybe is struggling or you want to give it a boost form actually four or five main points one plants can't tell the difference between the fertilizers what you decide to use is your choice and like I said what I learned is you just don't need as much fertilizer as you might think but plants can't tell the difference between you know biologically um, broken down nitrogen or fixated nitrogen or chemical nitrogen and really most important is too much nitrogen will hurt your plants you could burn your plants technically if you use too much nitrogen it will burn the leaves it could burn the roots um, a lot of these products won't do that but where you do the most harm is by using too much nitrogen the plant grows too fast it gets too uh, spindly it grows too many leaves actually the cell structure of the plants get weaker they're more susceptible to disease attack insect attack and basically you're making a very lush green leafy plant at the expense of the tomatoes the peppers or you know the vegetables you want and you're making a great haven for insects to come and easily feed on your plant so you don't want to overdo it there are the slow release fast release forms of nitrogen fertilizers so you gotta know what you're buying when you look it usually will tell you if it's a slow release or fast release but in general liquid fertilizers are fast relief granule forms are slower release use what is most available and convenient to you I found um, by doing these videos over the years my videos reach gardeners from all over the world everybody doesn't have access to this like we do here in the US everybody doesn't have Amazon delivery where you can just order something everybody doesn't have the space to make compost so use what you have available use what works for you and I just for example keep in mind a lot of people will say you know well use blood meal it's all organic well think about it the pigs that are slaughtered are highly processed cattle highly processed pigs we're using their blood it takes lots of energy to raise pigs it takes chemicals to grow the feed um, the animals get hormone shots all kinds of stuff is going on so the end product might be organic but the delivery of the product might not be as organic as you think so I've said before I use both organic products and synthetic products that's my choice but don't overstress about it a couple of um, recommendations I recommend try and make compost if you can use it in spring get it into your garden it's a low amount of fertilizer it's usually like a 111 but it adds to the uh, biodiversity of your soil it builds good soil it's it not only helps the plants but it helps the microbes and, and um, different organisms in your soil generally speaking pellets granules I put into my garden bed into the planting hole those are slow release I use liquid fertilizers more for my container plants because they really pull the nutrients out of the soil much more quickly than your tomatoes that grow in you know earth beds or use that fertilizer for a boost try and keep the the nitrogen number in the NPK or the ratio 12 or less you really in my experience don't need more than that you can go to something with like two five three or a six two zero um, this is another form of organic um, nitrogen it's heat dried microbes that have digested organic matter and wastewater basically sewage this 
product is actually the organisms that ate the sewage. Um, you're putting them into your earth bed, into your containers even if you want. And the organisms that are alive in your soil will then begin to break this down and bring nitrogen to your soil. That's another form of organic matter. Again, it's sewage. People may have issue with that. This is fish emulsion. This is made really from, you know, essentially rotting fish. And that is organic. I talked about this. This is organic. This is feather meal, composted manure. One more uh, way to bring nitrogen to your garden, and I really want to stress the value of it, is the beans, are the peas, are the crimson red clover. If you have the ability, you can cast a whole lot of beans, a whole lot of peas. Uh, crimson clover is a great way because you can buy it cheaply. Um, and grow these plants in your garden bed, turn it over before planting, and you're going to get a nice, uh, a nice amount of organic matter in your beds, and it will break down into, into nitrogen. So, if you can, compost in the spring, try some cover crops, and then pick out what you want that works best for you. And then finally, the most important thing is to really have fun. The goal of gardening is to enjoy the vegetables, is to, is to grow the vegetables. Don't be overwhelmed between all of these products, whether or not you could be organic, a gardener, or a synthetic gardener, or a combination of both, or one is better than the other. Pick out what works for you. Understand what the nitrogen numbers are, what you're putting into your garden, and just... Welcome to the Rustic Garden. Today I want to talk about phosphorus. It's a major macronutrient, and on most fertilizers you see uh, N, P, and K, and they come up as numbers like 24, 8, 16. That's nitrogen. This one's phosphorus. This one over here is potassium. So we're going to talk about the P or phosphorus. There are really six major macronutrients. These are elements, fertilizers that your plants really need to thrive. The main ones, again, are N, P, and K, and they are really the primary ones. That's what you always, always see. You see nitrogen. Uh, phosphorus and potassium on your fertilizer products, but also calcium, magnesium, and sulfur are macronutrients. I'm going to talk about them in other videos. So for phosphorus, why is phosphorus important? Phosphorus overall, generally speaking, is about the growth and maturity of your plant. Phosphorus helps with storing and transferring energy in a plant. It promotes strong root growth. It helps with flower and fruit production. You get more flowers, you get more fruit. It helps with plant and fruit maturity, which means the speed of growth. You want your plants, if they're supposed to mature in 60 days, you want them to mature in 60 days. If your tomatoes are supposed to get you know, to a certain size, or your peppers are supposed to get to a certain size, you want your fruit to get to full size, full maturity. Helps with uh, cell division and tissue growth. Um, has to do with the sugars and starches, but everything that your plant really needs to grow and mature um, involves phosphorus. That's why it's a macronutrient. Phosphorus fertilizer, how is it made? And you may have noticed in my videos, I'm not 100% chemical fertilizer. I'm not 100% organic um, gardener where I just use organic products. I use both and I use them in a sensible way and that's what I hope these videos show you is they show you how to use the products, it helps you understand the products and it helps you make a decision on what you want to use. So phosphate fertilizer, how is it made? Rock phosphate is the raw material. It's basically the element phosphorus on the periodic table. It has other things in there but it has the phosphorus. The phosphorus in rock phosphate is not quickly or readily available to your plants. It's a low availability of phosphorus for plants, which, which means is that rock phosphate will take a long time to break down and become available to your plant. So what we do is we take phosphate, we take the raw material, and we convert it into something your plant can use quickly. Rock phosphate in a process, it's either a wet process or a dry process, is mixed with phosphoric acid. That generally creates, it's a technical process, but that generally creates orthophosphoric acid. That's the form of phosphorus that is readily available to your plant. So the chemical process takes a raw ingredient, rock phosphate, 
puts it through a man-made process, human-made process, and it creates orthophosphoric acid. That is going to be readily available to your plant. There's also something called polyphosphate, which is just sh several chains of, of orthophosphoric acid bound together. When that product hits the ground, the polyphosphate then breaks down into orthophosphoric acid. But that's the chemical process. So you're taking the raw form of phosphorus, putting through a process, now you have something your plant can use quickly. And the key for phosphorus and fertilizers in general is, are they available to your plants right away, like that day and that week, or are they available to your plants down the line? So when you look on, um, pro uh, on fertilizers that have phosphorus, you're always going to see the term available phosphate. And that tells you the percentage of phosphorus in the product that will be available for your plant. For instance, you know, this could be, well, that's a chemical process, but let's just say you have uh, organic form of phosphorus. There might be some phosphorus your plant can't use right away, but then there's phosphorus your plant can use more quickly. I know it gets a little bit confusing, but you want to understand that it's available phosphate or even available nitrogen, available um, potassium. What is going to be available to your plant? And these numbers tell you. So it's, they make it kind of easy. So 9% of this product by weight, 45% of this product by weight is going to be available for your plant or your plants. Organic phosphate. This is an organic product. It's bone meal. It has 9% by weight of phosphorus that's going to be available. The second thing that you need to know is when is it going to be available. This is available really that week. This is available three to six months down the line and that's important. So if you're using manure compost they ha it has phosphate in it but that's going to be available to your plants three to six months down the line. If you're using rock phosphate or bone meal you also have to keep in mind what the pH level of your garden soil is. You want a pH level that's between 6 and 7 in general. As you get a pH level of 8 or higher or you're pushing from 7 up towards 10, I don't want to panic you like if you have a soil of 7.1, don't freak out. But as you get a higher alkaline level, as your, as your pH level goes from 7 towards 10, rock phosphate and bone meal will never be available to your plant. A chemical process happens where the phosphorus gets locked into other molecules, other chemicals in your soil. So pH is really important. If you have a pH that's below 7, between 6 and 7, rock phosphate generally can take a year to be ready and available to your plant. Bone meal can take several months. And that's important so that if your plants are struggling, say, with a phos uh phosphorus deficiency, or you think you're putting on something that's going to give your plants phosphorus that week, and you use rock, fo rock phosphate and bone meal, you're not doing that. You're putting it in there, but it's not going to be ready towards, you know, for several months or, you know, the following year. So again, you need to know when you use these products, when is the fertilizer, when is the phosphorus going to be ready for your plants to use? Hopefully that makes sense to you. And the bottom line is phosphate, bone meal, rock phosphate, bone meal, it needs, the phosphorus in those products needs the acidity to work with the product, break it down, and make it available to the plants. And if you think about it, what they did when they processed the rock phosphate in this, they added phosphoric acid to it and basically did this process. So it puts this into a form that's going to be available to your plant. I know it can be confusing, but I just wanted to give you some of the background so that you understand what's going on. Phosphorus deficiencies. What happens if your plant doesn't have enough, enough phosphorus? Basically, you're going to have a stunted plant. It's not going to be growing like it should. And you might notice plants just sit at a certain size. You can get leaves that are overly dark in color. When the plants are, are young, and this, I usually notice, notice this in tomatoes, you put your tomatoes out young, it's a little bit cold, they don't like the cold, so they're not growing as well. 
if you don't have phosphorus in the soil, the root systems aren't developing because it's cold. Now they're also not developing as quickly because it doesn't have enough phosphorus. And you can see the bottom leaves of your tomatoes or your plants start to turn yellow and work their way up. And it's important to understand that the oldest leaves are affected first. Why is that important? Because if you have a plant that's to a certain size and you see a problem starting on the bottom of the leaves and working its way up, it can be a signal to you that this could be more um, nutrient related than necessarily a disease. And some diseases do start at the bottom and work their way up. But it gives you a clue of what you might have to do for your garden. Also, your plants, and this happens a lot in tomatoes too, can get purple stems or purple veins in the leaves. Recommendations. I recommend um, a couple of things. In this case, uh, if your garden is struggling, get a pH test because you want to make sure your pH is between 6 and 7. A pH that is too low towards 0 or too high towards 10 and out of this range is going to affect the way all the nutrients, nitrogen, potassium, um, phosphorus, calcium, sulfur, magnesium, it's going to affect the way all these nutrients are absorbed by your plant. So if you're ever in doubt, your garden's struggling, a pH test will really help. If your soil again is too acidic, your phosphorus is going to be absorbed by uh, iron and aluminum oxides, which basically means it takes the phosphorus from the plant and locks it into a different form. If it's too alkaline, it means your phosphorus is going to be absorbed by calcium carbonate, and again, that'll be taken away from your plant. I think that actually forms maybe calcium phosphate. Second thing is if you're using synthetic products like straight bone meal, if you buy like an organic fertilizer that's like a you know two six seven it's going to have different forms of um, phosphorus in there. Some of them may be available right away some of them may need to break down. You have to read the package and understand it. But when you're using bone meal as the primary form of phosphorus this can take uh, several months to start breaking down and really be available for your plant. I use this um, a lot of times in the fall when I planted my garlic into the video on that I put in um, bone meal so that this will be breaking down as the bulb is dormant through the winter and when the bulb is up and growing um, the leaves and, and forming a strong garlic uh, bulb for the spring and early summer this will have broken down and it's available to the plant so that's a strategy I use. So I might use this product knowing that it's not going to be available three to six months down the line. If I was going to use rock dust, I would use that knowing that I'm building my garden um, for the future. So the first application of um, rock dust may not be available for you know six months to a year. So I'm also going to use, you know, possibly if I need it, because you may not need to use a straight phosphorus fertilizer, triple phosphate, where it's, you know, 45% by weight for adding phosphorus to your garden. You may just not need it and you can get away with other fertilizers. I'll talk about that. But I would use a synthetic form of phosphorus if I want to get it to my plants that week, really. Really get, you know, the spring bed set up, have phosphorus in there that's going to be readily available. I use the chemical fertilizer. So again, I'm not necessarily for organic, I'm not necessarily for chemical, I'm for understanding when to use these products. And that's what I just talked about, number four, is available phosphate is what plants use immediately. So you need to know when these are going to be available to your plant. If you're in doubt, just use a 10-10 fertilizer. Those are often uh, synthetic, chemically made. They will get all the major macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to your plant. You could use something like this. This is all organic. It has a 2-5-3 ratio. The phosphorus in there, the nitrogen in there, the potassium in there is going to be more quickly available for your plants, unlike bone meal, which will take longer. So you have to understand what you're putting in your garden and how your plants are going to use it or when your plants are going to be able to use it. But if you're ever in doubt, just go with the 10 10 10 fertilizer. It will save you a lot of headaches. Um, oh, and one more thing. What you might notice is this chemically processed uh, form of phosphate, triple phosphate, is just phosphorus. There's no nitrogen, there's no potassium, 
make sure you read it. It's a half a teaspoon per foot, feeds quickly, gets phosphorus to it. Does nothing else for your plants but adds phosphorus. When you go to bone meal, bone meal also has nitrogen in it. It's also high in calcium, so it has calcium in there. I think it was 6% calcium. Although this may take several months to be readily available for your, for your plants, you're also feeding your soil. A lot of organic fertilizers have the extra benefit of feeding the microbes and the organisms in your soil, so you really build better soil life. And in this case, you have nitrogen, you also have calcium. Calcium really helps prevent blossom end rot in tomatoes and other vegetables. So there is a benefit with lots of um, organic fertilizers in that it also feeds your plant, but also uh, builds soil life. This does not build soil life. There's also potential, and I you know, want to let you know this too, is that if you overuse chemical fertilizers, it can add more salts to your soil, it can kill life in your soil but it won't do that if you use them wisely. So don't be afraid that, oh my God, I can't use a chemical fertilizer, it's gonna destroy the life of my soil. That won't happen if you use it wisely. And in fact, I would recommend not necessarily using this at full strength. I never recommend using miracle Grow at full strength. Always keep the numbers down. You never need 24% nitrogen for your vegetable garden. You're gonna to get too many leaves. Cut it in half. So I hope this gives you a good idea of how to use phosphorus in your Welcome garden. Welcome to the Rusted Garden. Today I want to talk about potassium. It's one of the major macronutrients and there's really two levels of macronutrients. You have the first level which is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And potassium is the last number. So it's a K. It's represented as K. But when you look on fertilizer products you'll see 24, 8, 16. That last number is the potassium. So this is product for instance would be 16% uh, potassium. The other, the second level are the other major uh, macronutrients are calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, and I'm going to talk about each of these over the fall and winter. Potassium is an essential element. It's a fertilizer your garden needs. If you don't have it in your garden, your plants just aren't going to do well. It's uh, essential for plant protein production, which, you know, you have proteins throughout the whole system of the plant without potassium the whole plant's going to be affected, and that's what you have to keep in mind. It's responsible for the flow of nutrients up and down the system of the plant. It regulates water flow or turgor pressure, and basically, you, when you have a garden, your plants are somewhat rigid. They're growing upright. They look firm. They look good. They're not wilting. Where the turgor pressure is basically the amount of water or pressure inside of each cell. And the more pressure you have, the more rigid or upright your plant is. And you definitely need potassium to help manage that function of the plant. It's also responsible for opening and closing the, st the um, <laughs> stomata cells, or a stomata cell, singular, underneath your plant leaf. And that helps with the exchanges of gases coming in and out of the plant. It's also necessary to have a healthy plant overall. So you can think about potassium as really a necessary fertilizer element to make your plant grow to size and produce yields or vegetables to the amount that you want. Without it, you're going to have smaller vegetables, sometimes less vegetables. It's also responsible for helping your plant fight off pests and disease. And the main way it does that is really by regulating the pressure inside the cell. A stronger, healthier, you know, plant cell, the stronger, healthier plant that you have. And it's harder for diseases to get into the leaves or to attack the, or for pests to attack the plant. A potassium deficiency, what does that look like? Uh, unfortunately, it's later uh, fall here. It's November 9th, so I don't have examples that I can show you from regular plants. So, let me try and describe it. Potassium deficiency really, one, affects sandy soils more. Light soil, sandy soils where a lot of rain will go through, it can deplete the potassium out of your soils. For instance, I have clay soil, so potassium has never really been an issue. So if you have sandy soil or you have soil where water really flushes through it a lot, you just want to keep in mind, you know, how your potassium level is doing. If you notice curled leaf tips, not a curled leaf, not the whole leaf curled up, but just the the tips of the leaves are curled over, that could be a sign of potassium deficiency. Usually that same leaf on the edges of the leaves, they start to turn yellow. So it looks like yellow is outlining your leaf and then that yellow works its way into the center of 
the leaf and then the yellow leaves will also start to brown so this is really more with the outside part for instance if this was a leaf it's not yellowing all through here where it's just a fading yellow it's yellowing right along the edges and the curling would be just a little bit of curling like that that might be a tip that you have a potassium deficiency there's also something that's called chlorosis and let's see I don't have a blank here to show you but chlorosis would be if this my hand was the leaf and this is a vein these would stay green inside the leaf but right in the space in between them they'll start to yellow out so it doesn't look like an even yellowing across the leaf which sometimes is more about nitrogen or other issues but it's actually in the dark green veins of your plant stay the same but in between it starts to yellow out that's an idea that's a sign that potentially you have a potassium deficiency on the underside of the leaves you might have purple spotting uh, purple spotting and that could be a sign again a potassium deficiency this little arrow means usually when you have a, a potassium deficiency because potassium helps um, regulate movement up and down the plant the plant will take the potassium and send it to the good leaves so the upper leaves of your plant will look fine it's the bottom leaves that start getting these signs so you would really look for these problems starting in the bottom of your plant and then slowly working its way up now there is inorganic potassium monopotassium phosphate potassium nitrate potassium sulfate I recommend never using these you really don't need them in your uh, home gardens uh, if you're you know doing a farm maybe you might need this or something like that before I get to that people often ask me do you do soil testing I don't because my beds have had so much uh, action so to speak in there they've had a lot of organic matter they've had organic fertilizers they've had inorganic fertilizers I've moved soil around so to get a clean sort of even reading of potassium in my soil it would be difficult but I do recommend that if you're turning your ground over for the first time and you're just starting your garden that's when I would recommend doing a lot of soil tests for different fertilizers um, right at the beginning so you know what you're working with for me I've been doing this for 10 years so you could go to one bed test it it's going to be a little bit different than a bed across the way and then one bed might be different you know side to side so you have the in inorganic potassiums which I just recommend you never touch and you can see the levels it's a high potassium 34 44 50 I don't know what you would really need that for you're going to get plenty of potassium in other ways organic potassium there's a product called murate of potash and bottom line is there's chlorine related to this and you don't really want to use that even though you might see an organic product that says murate of potash the chlorine kills soil bacteria you just don't need that so keep that in mind the products I recommend are green sand here's a product this is uh, let's see is it five pound bag it's a seven and a half pound bag of green sand it's marine sediment it glauconate iron phosphate silicate so these this mineral and uh, iron potassium silicate will provide potassium to your garden and it only has a three so the NPK for this product is only a three and you really don't need more than this um, it will work if you want to add it into your soil that'll be great and this is what green sand looks like it is green and it's mined out of ancient seabeds really and then it's pulverized down so green sand is a good way to get potassium into your soil into your garden if you want it rock dust or granite dust that's another good product I don't have an example here I couldn't find any but you could put that into your into your um, uh, raised beds or into your containers and if you're kinda noticing green sand rock dust granite dust not only are going to have potassium but because they're ground up uh, minerals and different kind of nutrients they're also going to have a lot of something called micronutrients so they're going to give your soil other things besides just the phosphorus now you can also make it from burning hardwood if you have a fire pit outside you burn your hardwood the ash that remains um, can be thrown into your compost pile and that will also pro provide potassium and you might also hear the word potash potash is used um, really as a cinnamon a cinnamon yeah <laughs> a cinnamon of potassium 
And how that came to be is because you would take the ash from burned hardwood, put it into a uh, metal pot and carry it around and it just got converted to the word potash. The other thing that I like is banana peel. Banana peel really provides potassium to your garden. You can put it in your compost pile. I'm going to show you how I make it and I'll talk about that in a second. One thing that's interesting is right here, dried banana peels, 42% potassium. So you can get those, that fertilizer, that element into your garden without having to go and buy inorganic products. Recommendations. Don't buy chemical forms of potassium. You just don't need it. Your garden isn't going to be lacking so severely in potassium that you have to go buy something that's, you know, chemically made. I do recommend green sand, rock, uh, rock dust, ash, banana peels. These are all great organic ways to bring potassium into your garden. And if in doubt, because I understand, you know, you might not be able to get any of, any of these products, a simple 10-10-10 fertilizer will work. Like this is left over from my nitrogen video. 2% um, nitrogen, 5% uh, phosphorus, 3% potassium. This will put potassium, I'm sorry, we'll put phosphorus, yeah, will put potassium into your soil. And you could just use a product like that. You don't have to necessarily go get green sand or do anything with banana peels. So if you're in doubt, just a simple 10-10-10 all-purpose fertilizer get you the main macronutrients, including uh, potassium. Now, you can make your own, and I'm going to show you how to do that. And I actually make an organic fertilizer that I use right in the planting hole. I put in a tablespoon or two right into the planting hole when I plant tomatoes and peppers and other plants. You can burn hardwood. You have to, you know, buy, I think, oak as a hardwood. You want the hardwood. You don't want pine or anything like that, but specifically hardwoods. Burn the hardwood down, take the ash out, put it right into your compost pile, let it do its thing. Or if you want to take the ash, mix it into a bucket of water, just, you know, stir it up and then pour it over your bed. That is one way to get potassium into your garden. The other way to do it is to make it yourself. And I've done that um, in another video. And you can basically take your banana peels. If you eat bananas, save the banana peels, ask your neighbors to save, save them. If you just dry them out, you know, for about an hour or so at about, I don't know, 150, 180, 200, 220 degrees, doesn't matter. Just dry them down. Don't bake them and burn them, but just dry them out quickly. Once you dry them out, and the reason you want to do this, well, let me just say this first. If you're going to pulverize it, here's the process. If you're going to compost it, you're just taking the peel off, just throw the plain peel into your compost pile, and when the bacteria does its trick, the microbes do the trick, your banana will be broken down. But this is another way to do it. Dry it out, and this has surface area. Right now, this surface area is everything that you see. It's this part and this part. If you were to drop this into the ground, you have a surface area that is less than what I did right here. Once you start breaking something, because you break it, that becomes surface area. So the more you break it down, the more surface area it has. And why is that important? Because the more surface area you have, the quicker the bacteria and microbes in your garden will break this down and make it available to your plant. And this is the way that I do it. I just cut it up, I dry it out again, like I said, in the uh, oven it anywhere between 150 and 220 degrees whatever you're comfortable with put it all right into a coffee grinder and just chop it up when it's all done it goes into a bowl I usually do this with eggshells for the calcium maybe even thrown some magnesium, but now the surface area has been increased millions of times compared to this. And this is probably about a tablespoon and a half. So I would just put, you know, a tablespoon or so into my planting hole. That will be plenty of potassium to take care of your plants. Welcome to the Rusted Garden. Today I want to talk about calcium. It's one of six macronutrients. The main macronutrients you're used to seeing are nitrogen, potassium, 
um, sorry, phosphorus and potassium. And they're usually called the primary macronutrients. That's what you see in all the fertilizer packs. But there's also calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. They are also macronutrients. And macronutrients are really the six elements your garden really has to have in the right quantity um, for your plants to really thrive. Today we're going to talk about calcium. Before I get to the benefits of calcium, I just want to let you know most garden soils will have calcium in there, so you're not going to initially start out having a problem, and that's true for most of the fertilizers. But as you garden for a while, um, sometimes you have to add in these fertilizers to amend them. Sometimes your plants suck out a lot of the elements, depending on what you're growing. So you need to really understand what they are, and that's my goal, is for you to understand what calcium is. I'll show you a couple of products, and you can decide how you want to use it. Calcium benefits. Calcium is mostly a carrier molecule. You really need calcium in your plant because it transports the essential nutrients in and out of the plant cells. It's going to move carbohydrates, enzymes, elements, all kinds of things up and down your plant. It's really the transport sort of molecule, if you think about it, or the transport uh, piece of the plant. If you don't have calcium, the nutrients just aren't going to move up and down the plant. It strengthens cells, cell walls. It also helps with uptake of other elements in the soil. You have um, nitrogen, you have potassium in the soil. If you have too much calcium, it can combine with different elements. If you have too little, it can cause problems. So you need calcium to make sure your garden soil will give up the nutrients to your plants. And you need the right amounts. And it's very, very hard to mess up your soil um, by adding calcium. And I'm going to talk to you about ways that you can prevent that from happening too. Calcium deficiencies. You're going to have a stunted growth in your plant. The young leaves are going to be distorted. They're going to yellow and you're going to notice it right away. Calcium, unlike some of the other elements, you're going to notice it right away in the fruits. Well, maybe not right away, but you're going to notice as they develop. Tomatoes get blossom end rot. That's where they brown on the bottom. Celery gets black heart disease or black heart. Carrots get cavity spots and cabbages get internal tip burn. I haven't seen this. I haven't had that happen to my plants, but I have gotten blossom end rot more so in containers, and I'll talk about container soil too as we go on. Calcium problems. Calcium is absorbed with water, so you have to have water, but you have to have regular levels of water in your, in your garden, or your plants aren't going to be able to pull the calcium in. So if you have periods of drought, or times when your whole container dries out, or your garden soil dries out, you're going to have calcium issues with your plant and that's going to show up you know pretty quickly so make sure you maintain you know the moisture level of of your garden um, of your earth beds of your containers too much or too little calcium can impact how nutrient nutrients are absorbed from the soil and too much not calcium calcium itself ca the element won't change the ph but too much calcium carbonate a form of calcium can raise the pH levels, and I'll go over that more too as we talk. But just remember, calcium, the element, CA, won't change the pH of your soil. But that's what your plants need. They don't need calcium carbonate. They're not pulling calcium carbonate in. They're only pulling up the calcium. So a lot of these products have to uh, will introduce a form of calcium to your soil, but the soil has to break it down into a form your plants can use. pH levels. So if you're using calcium carbonate, which is comes to uh, really gets into your garden from a lot of different kinds of uh, lime or use of lime, you could change your pH levels. The general range, I'm going to do a video on this down the line, but general range of pH is 6 to 7, 6.5 is optimal. We're only going to be adding low amounts of calcium products into your soil, so you don't have to worry so much about the pH level. But if you are, you could also add in some peat moss, that's acidic, and that's what I tend to do in my guess is they kind of neutralize each other and I've been gardening in the same area for well over 10 years I haven't had any trouble with my pH levels calcium the element CA is considered the building block of the fruit so that's the most important thing to take away from calcium is you really need it for your uh, I think for your fruit to really develop you know to a good size to a good flavor my experience is that I grow peppers in the ground, in containers, and in half-sunken containers. When I add in more calcium to those plants, instead of having sometimes thin-walled and leathery peppers, I really find that the bell peppers have thicker walls. They're much more crispier, much more crisp and a snap to them when I break them open. I think it's due to the calcium. Don't have 100% proof, 
but that's my experience and I usually sometimes tend to neglect for whatever reason you know, the right side of my garden um, the other side that's getting more of the nutrients and calcium tend to do better blossom end rot is the main problem you're probably going to see or have seen in your garden and that again is when the bottom of the tomato turns brown and that's from an issue with calcium either your plant can't pull the calcium out of the soil or you don't have enough calcium in there. It happens a lot in containers. When you have a container, I've said before, I use five gallon containers, I use 10 gallon containers. You put the soil in, I do add in a lot more nutrients and amendments into that soil because the plants will suck the life out of that. There's no other really way that nutrients are coming into your container soil. And then plus when it rains, that rainwater will quickly go through, go out the holes in the bottom, so you're also leaching out nutrients. So container soil, really needs, I think, lime in it, or you're going to end up with blossom end rot on your tomatoes and other problems with other other vegetables you might be growing. Sandy soils, if you have sandy soil, when it rains, the water goes through quickly. As it goes through, it's going to leach out different elements that's in your soil. And fast-acting calcium, if you have blossom end rot, these are eggshells, that's calcium carbonate. They would have to go in your soil, break down, slow release, takes time. This won't fix your tomatoes when there's a problem. You need a fast acting form of calcium that just has the CA, the element, quickly available so your plant can pull it into its system real quick and correct the, plos the, the problem of blossom end rot. We're going to talk about slow release and fast release. A form of slow release calcium is dolomitic lime. It's actually calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate. These two things are not pulled directly into your plant. They have to break down in the soil so that calcium and magnesium are rendered. When you use dolomitic lime, you get the benefit of calcium and you also get the benefit of magnesium. So you get two macronutrients put into your soil. And again, it's the calcium carbonate that raises pH level. So this will go into your soil, into your container, and then over time, the soil will go through a process, break this down into a form that your plant can use. You also have a slow, re slow release form of calcium called gypsum. That's uh, calcium sulfate, CaSO4. This will not raise your pH, but it could lo lower your pH. And this is a form of calcium and sulfur. So this is going to also provide some sulfur to your garden, which is another macro uh, nutrient. Again, this has to break down into a form where the calcium is set free, the Ca is set free from the SO4. That calcium will be pulled into your plant. Your plant can use it. Slow release. It will take some time for that process to happen. Other forms of slow release calcium are eggshells. You can pulverize them down. They're mostly calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate needs to break down and free up the calcium, like I was saying. There's also a form of lime called um, calcite, where it's just plain old uh, calcium carbonate. Um, oyster shells, I think, is cal are also calcium carbonate. People use that, pulverize that down. But whenever you have calcium carbonate, it has to break down in some capacity to free up the plain old element Ca, calcium, so that your plant can pull it in. Hopefully that makes sense. Now we have some mixed release forms, and this is garden lime. It says uh, garden lime. It's derived from dolomitic, dolomitic, yeah, <laughs> dolomitic lime. And the reason I think it says derived is because I think there's a little bit of a chemical processing or some sort of processing because it's not just straight calcium carbonate and magnesium carbonate. It also has calcium oxide. Calcium oxide comes from heating calcium carbonate. It's got calcium, magnesium, uh, magnesium oxide, magnesium carbonate. And maybe they, you know, analyze it differently and I don't quite get it. But this product, because it has available calcium, magnesium, that's going to get to your plant a little bit more quickly. And it also has the carbonate um, of magnesium and calcium. That's going to have to break down and release over time. So this may be a little bit more fast acting, not quite as slow acting as pure dolomitic, dolomitic lime. Hopefully that makes sense. And if you have more information about um, this product and how they analyze it and how they break it down, I would really love to understand exactly you know, what the analysis was was and why they say it's derived from dolomitic lime. It makes me think it's processed in some way. But I would recommend this and we'll talk about dosing in a little bit. You also have same company, you have uh, garden gypsum. It has uh, K2 
calcium sulfate in it, calcium sulfate dihydrate, which is the addition of H2O into it in some capacity, also has calcium and sulfur. And again, I think it's processed in some way in that, you know, the analysis says these are the components in there. And when you look at them, it's 68%, 86%, 20%. It doesn't really add up to 100%. So they're calculating it based on what's actually available in there that I quite just don't understand. However, because it has free calcium and free sulfur, this is going to work a little bit quicker for your plants. And then the sulfate as it breaks down, the calcium sulfate as it breaks down, will come available down the line. Hopefully that makes sense. Fast release, you have calcium nitrate. Calcium nitrate is actually something I just ordered 25 pounds of and I'm gonna use it in my garden as a fast release foliar spray for when I see um, blossom end rot and other problems that I think are related to calcium. I did a video on calcium carbonate eggshells where I pulverized it down, explained that it's only calcium carbonate and it's a slow release. Then I showed you how you add in white vinegar. Vin vinegar will react with the calcium carbonate, free up plain old calcium, which then can be taken in by your plant quicker. And that would be a way that you could use eggshells to help treat blossom end rot, is that you have to use that weak acid to break the calcium carbonate so that you have calcium available for your plant. Calcium nitrate is really the addition of nitric acid to limestone. Creates calcium nitrate, which will be calcium and nitrogen, two things that are needed for your plants. It can be, it's very water soluble. It won't change the pH. It's just plain old calcium. There's no calcium carbonate in there. You can use it on your plants. I will talk about that more when I understand it better and start using it. Now, I do have some recommendations. First recommendation, I'm gonna start at the bottom, use less. When you plant a plant, you can put in, you know, two tablespoons of garden lime from dolomitic lime. It says up to four. Don't overdo it. Just put it into the planting hole, mix it in well. That is a great start for your plant. Same thing with the gy gypsum, one or two tablespoons. This talks about adding almost a pound to established plants. You don't need to do that. You don't need to follow these products to, you know, the perfect degree. And I also think they tend to make us think we need to use more than we have to. Just use less. You're not going to change the pH. You're going to give your plants what they need. It makes a difference. And never overuse them. You don't need to use more than the directions say. Most soils have calcium in it. So remember, when you start gardening, your garden soil is going to have most of these products. As you start growing things and you start having plants pull out um, nutrients, you're going to have to use these products more. Compost and water regularly. If you can compost and put organic matter, compost into your soil, keep the moisture level going, you're going to really take care of much of the problems related to calcium. If you're gardening in containers, you're going to have to use more lime or calcium carbonate, some sort of, of these forms. Um, lime itself, calcium carbonate, can raise pH. Gypsum can lower pH because of its um, calcium sulfate will bring it down. So this will raise pH, this will lower pH, but in order to do that, you have to be using a whole lot of it. Real quick, this is what it looks like. That's garden lime, pelleted, dolomitic lime. This is gypsum, they look very similar. So I hope you understand a little bit about what garden lime can do. You can also find organic products that have NPK, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur in there. You could use this instead of those. But now I hope you have a sense of how you might use calcium in your garden and can better understand, you know, what to do. Again, I want to stress, don't overuse these fertilizers. Please check out my blog at www.therusticgarden.blogspot.com and also check out my YouTube videos. Thanks. Welcome to The Rustic Garden. Today I want to talk about magnesium. It's one of the major macronutrients that your plants need to have in the garden soil so that they thrive and do really well. The main macronutrients we always hear about are nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, but there's also calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. And today I want to talk about magnesium. What does magnesium do for your plant? Why is it needed? Magnesium is required really to give the leaves the green color. It's really involved in the production of chlorophyll. So if you don't have enough magnesium in your soil, your plants aren't going to be as green. They're going to have trouble with uh, chlorophyll production. And if you think about it, if your plants don't have chlorophyll, chlorophyll they're not going to get you know, the energy they need from the sun, and they're just not going to do well. The magnesium also helps to give us strength to cell walls. It's involved in enzyme production. It's involved in seed germination, and it helps the plant um, 
also take up other nutrients that are in the soil. So if you don't have enough magnesium, your plant may not be able to pull in the nitrogen that's in there. So it's, it's really essential. You need to have magnesium. The good news about magnesium is it's in most soils, so you don't have to over-worry that you know, it's not in there. But keep an eye on your plants. If you have a deficiency, the deficiency will look like this. If you have a tomato plant and you have the green veins going through the tomato plant, and you can see the veins if you look closely, the spaces in between those veins will start to go from green to yellow out. So the, the veins stay green, but the yellowing starts happening in between those veins, and it'll usually start on the bottom of the leaves. And if you watched my other videos, that also sounds like other possible deficiencies. And you can kind of see that your plants may react in a way that sounds similar, yet we're not exactly sure, you know, what, you know, fertilizer may be lacking in your garden. So you're always just looking for plant stress, and then you kind of have to have a mental checklist of how are you supplying nitrogen, how are you supplying phosphorus, how are you supplying potassium. Um, if you are putting that into the soil, then maybe it's a chance that maybe it's not enough magnesium. So it's sort of a process of elimination. So if you have the deficiency, you have the yellowing between the leaf veins, you can have leaf curl, the leaves can turn purple or red, sometimes the stems can look uh, a different color. But most importantly, you can just have a stunted plant, stunted growth, and probably your plant's going to die. That's with the deficiency. And again, it's very hard for soils not to have magnesium in it, especially in the home garden, where you're turning over soil that's been around for a long time and you're putting plants into there. Now, part of my goal of these videos is just to help you understand what the fertilizer is, what the nutrient is, what the element is, and you can make decisions if you want to use it or not use it. You can do soil tests to see what's in your garden, uh, you know, nutrient-wise. Um, it's up to you, but I really want you to understand where you can uh, find magnesium in products and add it to your garden. And there's two main ways that I, I think, or there are at least two main ways. Garden lime, pelleted lime, this is dolomitic lime. It's 10% magnesium, 17% magnesium oxide, 15% magnesium carbonate. And it's pelleted by the company so that it's easy to use. But this is a slow release product. And this is Epsom salts. It's hydrated magnesium sulfate. It's about 10% magnesium and it's fast release. So right now, our, the two products I have are a slow release and a fast release. And you would use them in different ways. The garden lime, again, is a slow release and it can also raise the pH of your soil. But if you're using it in a sensible way and you're not overusing it, your soil pH isn't going to vary that much. Magnesium sulfate, again, fast release. You can make this uh, a mixture in water. You can pour it right onto the leaves. It won't change the pH. So this is fast act acting. It's a foliar feed, and it won't change the pH of your garden soil. If you were going to use garden lime, the best way to use it really is to put in two to four tablespoons. I keep tablespoons all over the place out in my yard, but it's just one two and maybe you know one or two more right into the planting hole mix it in really well disperse it throughout the whole planting hole put your plant in and that will get magnesium and it will also get lime into your garden or, or I'm sorry it will also get calcium into your garden and calcium is another macronutrient which I will talk about in another video so I usually put the lime in at planting and that's just to get it in the soil let it start uh, interacting with the garden soil the environment, let it start breaking down, let it start getting into a usable form of magnesium for your plant. Now Epsom salts, I use about one to two tablespoons per gallon. I sometimes use it at planting if I don't have the lime available, but mostly I'll do a uh, mix at blooming time. So when your plants start to bloom, that's when I give them the first dose of Epsom salts, and that's one tablespoon in a gallon of water. I pour it right over the plant, just soak the leaves real quick, soak some of the soil around there, and your plant will be able to absorb magnesium. And then again, maybe about two weeks later, and that's at the point where your plant is flowering and setting fruit, and that's when I find it needs the boost of magnesium sulfate. And that's just from my experience that I think the tomatoes, the peppers, the eggplant, the nightshade family plants, really seem to get a benefit from 
you know, two feedings of Epsom salts during the growing season. I think the plants are bushier. I think the fruits are a little bit bigger. And I think I get more production. And, you know, that's just by me eyeballing it when I use the product. Now, that being said, I said I use this for the nightshade plants. Um, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant. I even use them on my potatoes. If you're growing lettuce, radishes, you don't really need to do this process with it. They're going to be fine with the magnesium that's in there. But the bigger plants, again, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, I will use this. I'll also use it for cucumbers, uh, zucchini, squashes, the plants that really seem to suck the life out of the soil. Um, I will use Epsom salts. And also, gardening, gardening in containers. I will use lime in my container soil, and I will also hit it with... Uh, magnesium sulfate. And the reason being is in a five gallon container with a massive plant, all the nutrients are just getting pulled out of there. So you really want to use these products, I think, more in containers. Just something to keep in mind. Now, what I usually say is don't use more fertilizer than you need. Use less. It's okay. I don't want to freak people out and have them think they got to go through all these products and get it all into their soil. In a home garden, if you're turning soil over for the first time, or even been gardening for a while, you have a lot of product in there, a lot of fertilizers, a lot of nature, a lot of everything. So your plants are going to do pretty well. But at times, you do need to add in the fertilizer. So that's why I want to educate you on you know, what to do with these different products. And want to stress, use less. Now, compost and organic matter, if you're putting in compost regularly, if you're putting in organic matter regularly, you're going to be already adding in a lot of the macronutrients, a lot of the micronutrients, so your garden is going to be taken care of. So just don't overuse these products. Don't panic. Most importantly, I hope you enjoy your garden. I hope you enjoy the process of starting something from a little seed, taking care of it, you know, growing it to full size, and then enjoying the vegetables. Please check out my blog at www.therustedgarden.blogspot.com and also check out my YouTube videos. Thanks. Welcome to The Rusted Garden. Today I want to talk to you about another major macronutrient, sulfur. I've talked about nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, NPK, the main ones that you see on most fertilizers, and those are the ones you hear most about. But you also have calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. You need them in lesser uh, quantities, but they are essential for your plants to thrive and do well in your home garden. So today we're going to talk about sulfur couple things that are interesting is one you need very little sulfur so don't again as I said in other videos don't think that you need to go put in a whole lot of sulfur you need to put it into every planting hole you just don't need to do that about 95 percent of the total sulfur content in your garden is going to come from organic matter so if you're putting in compost if you're putting in organic matter you're already supplying your garden with what it needs to create um, a form of sulfur that your plants can use. So in this case, you know, composting organic matter really makes a difference. Whoop. Now sulfur, the elemental uh, symbol for sulfur is S, but it has to be converted into a sulfate, SO4. It's also negatively charged, but those are details, you know, we don't need to talk about in this uh, video. But soil bacteria will change sulfur into SO4 or into a sulfate through a process called mineralization. So your garden is going to do what it has to do to create a usable form of sulfur for your plants. So it's a slow process. So when you compost, slowly the bacterial will change sulfur over into a sulfate. So this is an ongoing slow process that will keep a nice supply of sulfur uh, going, uh, uh, yeah, a fresh supply of usable sulfur in your garden so your plants can use it over time. Now sulfur does have to be replenished, but if you keep the compost in there, it's going to keep coming. It can get leached out by rain if you have a sandy soil, though a rainwater coming through because of the, the charges of the ions and stuff will pull that sulfur quickly, the usable sulfur quickly through your soil into, you know, down too far so your plant can't use it. So keys again, maintain organic matter. Now if you have a deficiency in sulfur, it's hard to tell. I'm going to talk about the benefits in a second. But you'll get yellow leaves again. Um, you have poor growth. But it's hard to tell exactly that you have a sulfur problem based on deficiencies in the soil and then how they affect your plant. But you don't have to worry too much about that. I mean, if you're supplying the organic matter, 
um, maybe a little bit of sulfur during the season, your plants and your garden will be fine. There are three main sources of sulfur. Again, I want to stress again, organic matter. The actual breakdown of organic matter into compost will supply your garden, the bacteria in your soil, with what it needs to make a usable form of sulfur. You can also have general minerals in your garden that will break down over time. And also sulfur dioxide, if you don't know what that is, that's acid rain in a lot of the industrial areas where um, you just have a lot of factories, uh, sodium, I'm sorry, sulfur dioxide goes into the air, mixes with the rain, comes down to your soil, you know, now you have sulfur in your garden. The benefits of sulfur, generally speaking, sulfur is about growth and nutrition. It helps plants use other elements like nitrogen and phosphorus, so it has to be present so your plant can properly use the nitrogen and phosphorus coming into the plant and also throughout the plant. It's responsible in the synthesis of amino acids, vitamins, and proteins, and that sort of makes sense that if your plant can't make what it needs in the way of amino acids, vitamins, proteins, it's just not going to thrive, it's not going to do well. And legumes like beans and peas need nitrogen present so that that, I'm sorry, needs sulfur present so that it helps the nitrogen uh, fixate to the plant and get used up by the plant. Benefits though, growth and nutrition. You need it or your plant's just not going to thrive. Recommendations, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this video because it's pretty straightforward in the sense that you should really have enough sulfur in your garden if you're composting. But I'll talk about these two products that you can use. Compost organic matter, said it a bunch of times, said it one more time, I'm going to say it again. Compost organic matter will help you maintain the sulfur levels in your garden. Even watering, you don't ever want your garden to dry out, you don't want your containers to dry out. It will affect the way nutrients are absorbed by your plants. But also you want to have good drainage. If too much water sits in your garden, it does impede the way sulfur is pulled into your plant. So you want good drainage in your garden soil. Best ways to add it, and again you're not going to be saying, oh I need sulfur, but you use some other products. I use magnesium sulfate, I have a couple videos on it, probably will do one more in this series on how you use magnesium sulfate or Epsom salts. This is a fast release form. It gives your plants magnesium. It's already in a sulfate form. It can be pulled in through the leaves, picked up by the roots very quickly. So when you're using Epsom salts, you're giving your garden a dose of sulfur and that's probably all you really need. You're not going to need more than this. If you're not using Epsom salts, if you're adding maybe calcium to your soil or you're using gypsum, gypsum also has calcium sulfate in there. Again, the sulfur is in the form that your plant needs. So uh, gypsum, Epsom salts, here's what they look like. That's the magnesium sulfate. This is the gypsum. They have a form of sulfur your plants can use. This is a fast release. This is sort of a mid-speed release in that it's already in a form that your plant wants. And compost is a slow release process. So you want to be composting from the start of the season throughout the year and the next year. But as that breaks down over time, you're just going to have a nice release of sulfur or you get yeah, you'll have a nice release of sulfur. It will be changed into a form your plant can use and your garden will have enough sulfur. So you don't really need to stress about this macronutrient. You just got to make sure you have the compost and organic matter in there. And if you want to just throw maybe one time a year some Epsom salts on your plant or some gypsum around your plant, you can do that. This will give it calcium and sulfur. This will give it magnesium and sulfur. In this You'll be case, good there is go. really no soil life. So using a chemical fertilizer isn't going to harm soil life. And the flip side is, because there's no soil life in here, there's nothing to really break down some of your organic fertilizers to change them into a form that the plant can use. So what does that mean? When you're doing seed starts like this, you have to make sure you have a chemical fertilizer because that's readily available. Those nutrients can be picked up right away by the plant or you have to be using an organic fertilizer that's in the soluble form, which means the plant can use it right away because there's no soil life to break down some of your organic products. And again, keep in mind, sometimes people like organic fertilizers more because they help build soil life. Well, there is no soil life in here so you're not harming anything and there is no soil life to really work with the organic fertilizers and if you decide to go organic you really have to make sure you're buying the right product 
So I don't want organic fertilizers for my seed starts. And for the reasons that I sta stated, um, I don't like the smells of some of them indoors. Um, they're in form sometimes that insects will enjoy more and there's little micronutrients in them. So you really have to work hard to find an organic product that covers N, P, and K, all the micronutrients, and is in a soluble form that your seed starts can do. You can do it. It's more expensive and more work, but if that's what you prefer, just make sure you're getting an organic fertilizer that makes itself available to your seed starts. And again, if you want it organic, make sure it's soluble, it covers N, P, and K, it has micronutrients, and don't overspend. One of my biggest concerns is not as a person organic or a chemical fertilizer, a combination of both, and I mostly try and be organic, but I use all products in a specific way. Don't overspend because we're starting to get ripped off with the organic products being packaged as, you know, almighty, you have to use it, and you're jacking your price up. It's just, it's expensive. So just know what you're doing. If you want to go organic, that's fine. Like I said, soluble, covers N, P, and K, micronutrients. But if you want to go with miracle Grow or some of these products I'm going to show you, they're okay too. They don't hurt your plants. They don't hurt you. So for instance, when I was using miracle Grow, it's a 24-8-16. That means it was 24% nitrogen, 8% um, uh, NP phosphorus, and 16% 16, 16 um, potassium. That's too much. You don't want that much fertilizer on your seed starts. Use less fertilizer, no matter what you're using, organic, chemical, use less. These are small plants, as you can see. There's no rain to come down and wash any of these soluble fertilizers away, and you have evaporation. What that means is, is if I fix, say, a box of miracle Grow, one tablespoon into a, a gallon of water, it's going to be 24% nitrogen, 8% um, phosphorus, 16% potassium. That's going to be absorbed into you know, the starting mix. It's going to sit there. When it evaporates, the water evaporates out. The chemicals, the fertilizers, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium are going to start to form in the soil at a higher um, concentration than what you intended. And that's bad. Too much fertilizer can cause problems and damage your plants. So, Remember, the concentration of fertilizer that you put into these seed starts can damage your plants. Less is better. Okay, so what's the guideline? Here's the guideline using miracle Grow. So miracle Grow is 24, 8, 16. Most of the time you hear me for outdoor gardens now, lately in my containers, use half strength. That brings it down to a 24, 8. That's better. You don't really need more than that. Indoors, I would still even go further. I'd take it down to a quarter, and that leaves you with a six, two, four, you know, and that's better. You don't need a lot. Compost, for instance, is just like a 1% nitrogen, 1% um, phosphorus, 1% potassium. You, you just don't need these high numbers. So for a guideline, if you're doing your seed start, you want to be somewhere at like a five, five, five or less, generally speaking. You know, there's no set amount. This is just more for understanding what you're using. So for instance, this is a 10-10-10 all-purpose fertilizer. Let's just say it's one capful into a gallon of water. Use half of that. That'll bring it down to a 5-5-5. Five, five, five. You can even bring it down um, to a quarter and be 2.5, 2.5, 2.5. That will be effective to take care of your seed starts. This one is a 304 fertilizer mixed a tablespoon to a gallon. There is insoluble nitrogen in here though, so that's what you have to read for. So it's only 0.5% soluble nitrogen, 2.5% insoluble. And all that means is insoluble is a slow release fertilizer that you, and this is a chemical, uh, this is an organic product that has to be broken down by soil life, but there's no soil life here. So you want to go, you know, to something maybe more like this where Let's see if I can find it quickly. This is a 15-30-15 fertilizer. It's chemical, which means it was processed by you know, people. Um, it's in a form that can be readily absorbed by these plants. But you know, the 15, I think it was what? 15, 30, 15, I already forgot. That's too much. You want to bring that down to half strength, to quarter strength, and use that in here. 
Now, when do you fertilize? That's probably the biggest question. I wanted to cover what you're using. And one more thing too, let me just pull these over here. The other reason I like the uh, fertilizer you mix with water, this is organic fertilizer that you can't really use in your seed starts. That's too much. This is like feather meal, all kinds of different things, alfalfa meal. This is great for outdoor garden, mixing it into your containers where you have some soil life and air or right into your earth beds. And this is a slow release fertilizer. So make sure you know what you're buying. You don't want to buy something like that. You want to get the fertilizers that are organic or chemical and mix in water because that's much easier to regulate and manage and it allows your plants to absorb it. So when do you fertilize? Well, these plants have been growing at different rates. Today is January 23rd. These are onions. These have been in there since uh, January 10th. So they've been in there 13 days. As Soon as they're fully up and they're growing their second leaf, so to speak, that's when I'll start fertilizing them. These are, uh, this is I think arugula, some sort of lettuce, and I forget what else. But these are planted on 116, so these have been growing for seven days. And these are just actually, I'm just test seed starting, no, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm test germinating my seeds that I sell, so these are all germinating nicely. This is not how I would grow this. But these have been growing now for seven days. They don't quite yet have their second set of leaves. This is the first set of leaves, and in between there, another leaf will come out. That's the, the true leaf. So you're really looking for the second leaf that comes out. This is oregano, nope, this is thyme, that went into the ground, and ran into the seed start on the 18th. So this has been five days. All of these don't need fertilizer right now. So when do you do it? All right, most plants take, say, seven days to germinate, Use this as a guideline. So first seven days, they just get water. Then once they germinate, they take another five to seven days to get their uh, second leaves or their true leaves. So really, you can say first week, they're germinating. Second week, they're growing. When they're growing in their second week, they're actually using the seed for nutrients. So they don't need the fertilizer right then. So really, when you start your third week, that's when you're going to fertilize. And because Everything germinates at different rates and people are growing different things. I can't give you the exact recipe for fertilizing. So week one, they germinate. Week two, they grow, they get their second leaves. Week three, you're going to fertilize every other watering, you know, for another 10 to 14 days for another two weeks. So I just do this. This would be your one gallon container, fertilizer, half or quarter strength, you know, and you just rotate water. Then when it dries up again, the fertilizer, water. And then when you get into your fourth week, for most plants, every watering just use your half strength or quarter strength fertilizer and that will take care of them. Also sometimes at the fourth week, they're coming out of these cells and going into your transplant cups, but you would fertilize them the same way. I hope that makes sense. And this is probably what's most important. You can always add more fertilizer if your plants are struggling. You can't really take it away. If you put in too much and it concentrates and builds up, it will damage your plants. And then when plants get damaged by fertilizer, sometimes they turn yellow or they change color and they look like, you know, they have some sort of deficiency. So we, then we add more fertilizer and we're just worsening the problem. Greater damage comes from over, over fertilizing seed starts, for real, period. More fertilizer for your seed starts is not better and I don't recommend you over fertilize. Follow, if I was going to pick something, I don't mind going with the chemical fertilizers at half strength or quarter strength. If you go with the organic fertilizers, make sure you find soluble fertilizer that covers, you know, NP and K and the micronutrients. Welcome to the Rustic Garden. Today I want to talk to you about when do you fertilize your squash, zucchini, and cucumbers. When do you fertilize your indoor plants? A couple of things to keep in mind is sometimes your starting mix has no fertilizer in it. If you buy like a miracle Grow product, it will have fertilizer in there and it's usually a low amount. Sometimes I will add fertilizer to my starting mix, but I do it at half strength. And that's the whole key of this video is your plants don't need full dosings of fertilizer in the starting mix or they don't need full dosings of the liquid fertilizer while they're growing like this. Half strength. Some people even use quarter strength. So regardless if your plants have fertilizer in the starting mix or not, you're going to fertilize with a half strength 
liquid fertilizer, maybe a quarter strength if you want. You're going to fertilize these plants when, when they have a true leaf. This is a zucchini, that's a true leaf. These are the two leaves that actually break the surface, that's a true leaf. Here's a cucumber, it has a bigger true leaf. These are the two leaves that break the surface. surface. And this is a um, early yellow squash and you can see how much bigger it got. And it really has two leaves, but somewhere around you know, here you want the first fertilizing and you can see this plant is staying healthy. So you don't have to be super exact, but you're probably going to fertilize them in about two weeks. These plants were planted on January 22nd. Today is the 12th of February. So this is three weeks of growth. They grow pretty fast. For the liquid fertilizers, a couple of things to keep in mind is I will use organic products out in my garden in my greenhouse, but I don't like using them indoors because to me they smell bad. I don't like fish, fish emulsion indoors. Um, it just doesn't smell good. Here is a kelp product and the biggest thing for the liquid fertilizers when you're doing squash, zucchini, and cucumbers and actually any plant indoors is you want the three main ingredients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to be represented. And you can see here, if it's not too small, this is a 0.13 nitrogen, zero phosphorus, 0 0.60 potassium. This is not a good liquid fertilizer for your indoor plants. You want phosphorus. Phosphorus helps with the root development. You want strong roots with your indoor transplants, especially, you know, if not with all the plants, definitely with your squash, your zucchini, your cucumbers. You want them, want them to establish well under the soil as much as the leaves look green. So you're not just going for plain old nitrogen, which makes green leaves. You want phosphorus too. Here's an organic product. It's made from beet juice. And on the back, it has eight for nitrogen, which is great for the leaves, zero for phosphorus, zero for potassium. This would not make a good liquid fertilizer for your indoor transplants. You want all the main numbers to be represented, N, P, and K. Now when I say represented, there's not an exact number that works. Um, if I could pick one, you know, a 363 would be great. Three nitrogen, six phosphorus, three potassium. But gardening is something that's done all over the globe and everybody doesn't have access to organic or inorganic fertilizer. Sometimes people have to make it themselves. They can't just go to the store and, you know, find eight, ten different kinds of fertilizer. So don't worry about that. The main key for this is half strength. Whatever you buy as a liquid fertilizer, make sure it has NPK numbers, that it's represented with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and then use Number it at half strength. A soluble fertilizer is a form of N, P, and K, or a form of nutrients that's immediately ready to your plants. That means when you mix it with water, pour it onto the leaves, pour it into the soil, the N, P, K, and other nutrients can be absorbed uh, right away, really, by your plant. Insoluble fertilizers are more like fertilizers that are in the uh, gr uh, granule form that you uh, buy organic, put it into the ground, and the microbiology has to break that down. So it's slowly released to your plant over time. So we're talking about soluble, water-soluble fertilizers. And these products get mixed into water. Now there's two kinds you can buy. You can buy organic. Fish fertilizer is organic. It's basically emulsified fish, fish parts, fish body, into a fertilizer. And that fertilizer has a nitrogen of five, um, phosphorus of one, potassium of one. It's a, a 511 NPK. Now the processed or chemical fertilizers, this is actually a 153015. You don't need that. Cut it down to about a quarter strength and you get a 484 fertilizer, or close to that. I round it up. Two different fertilizers. The second thing is organic is not better for you or for your plants. People hate that, but it's true. The processed chemical fertilizers will not harm you or your plants. The chemical fertilizers are harmful to soil life when abused and used in like um, high-end industrial farming where they're just, you know, putting down tons and tons of chemical fertilizers over tons of acreage, and that's all they did year after year. They wipe out the soil life. You're not using it like that. Organic fertilizers are wonderful, but this is a fish fertilizer. If you have cats or animals in your area, and you put down a fish fertilizer, you're going to attract those cats and those animals to your, to your garden. So what I like to teach is you can use either one. You don't have to be 100% organic. You don't have to be 100% chemical, but use what works. This is also cheaper. Using this at quarter strength is going to save you a lot of money. What do I do? I use both. 
To mix this up, you just follow the directions, but it's two tablespoons per gallon of water. This is typically one tablespoon per gallon of water. Um, I cut it down again to quarter strength because you just don't need the 15, 30, 15. You can use these about every seven to 14 days depending on the size of your plants. And I want to show you how you water them in because you don't put one gallon per plant. This is actually to cover 25 square feet. This is actually to cover 10 square feet. But I just want to mix it up, show you how I use it just to give you some idea. And again, the key is that you need some water soluble fertilizers for your garden at times. And especially when you have containers, when these aren't really um, soil systems that are alive like your earth beds. You know, there is soil life in there, but they're, they're just let's say for instance there's no earthworms in there there's probably none in those flower boxes the microbiology is very different so if you're waiting for organic uh, insoluble fertilizer to break down it may take a long time so you want to use soluble fertilizers in your container plants let's get to mixing and I'll just show you how you know I pour this on so these are my container plants we're going to go out into the earth beds too this is fish emulsion two tablespoons per gallon those are sweet potatoes and cilantro. And every 7 to 14 days, depending on the size of your plants, that's all you really have to do. Silvery fir tomato, some more cilantro. The fish fertilizer, these are potatoes, is a 511 NP and K. And remember, the key point, there's a tomato in there, the key point is soluble fertilizers have nutrients that are immediately available to your plants and I like to use them here's a broccoli plant in containers because the soil life is very different than your earth beds the biology is different so if I were to drop down granular um, organic fertilizer that's insoluble and just put it on top that's not going to feed these plants right away. It's going to kind of sit there, break down over time, and it can take months. Let's go out into the garden, show you the same thing. But that's all you need to do every 7 to 14 So this days. is one of my beds. It's 4 feet by 6 feet. That's 24 square feet. That's about how much you would put one gallon of fish fertilizer down. This cauliflower and same thing. I don't really pay so much mind to the square footage. Just soak it in like that. The fish emulsion is a 511 fertilizer. The nitrogen is great for leaf growth, but the one, one is kind of low for when your plants get into fruit production and flower production. And that's when I might use the chemical fertilizers. And again, all products are chemicals. Everything on the planet is a chemical. You can't make fake nitrogen. You can't make artificial potassium. It's just not possible. But we're true people would have turned other elements into gold. It's just not possible. But this is how I would use the fish emulsion in this plot. Just soak it down every seven to 14 days. More often when the plants are bigger, less often when they're smaller. So this is the chemical fertilizer and it's being used at one quarter strength. And when you get to plants that are in production, these are strawberries, they're gonna be producing fruit. Sometimes you wanna focus more on the potassium and the phosphorus. Garlic, not so much interested in leaf growth now, they're growing the garlic bulb, but that's it. Just soak it in just like that. Tomato, fine, give it a toss. And I would use the chemical fertilizers just like this every seven to 14 days, depending on the size of the plant. For plants that are in little cups like this, process chemical fertilizer. You want the fertilizer to get right to the plants. Let's go out into the garden. I'll show you how I take care of them. Common sense rules. These are my greens that overwintered. I'm eating them this week and have been eating them really for the last week. Don't put the chemical fertilizers or fish emulsion on the leaves if you're going to be eating the plants over the next seven, ten days. Just get it right onto the ground. And this way you don't have to really worry about, you know, washing everything. Uh, perfectly you can just pick the leaves because you know it's your garden and you didn't put anything on them before you eat them over here I've got my cool weather crops kohlrabi beets endive and I would just soak it just like that and funny quick story is as I was making this video my wife came down and when I went back in she was looking all over the kitchen for something that smelled awful well that was because I was 
filling up the watering container with fish emulsion in the kitchen sink. It does smell bad. So if you're having some sort of barbecue or people over, don't use the fish emulsion that day or the day before. It takes about three days for the odor to go away. And if you have cats or animals around, the fish emulsion can attract them to your garden. 